there's one rock that can cause catastrophic climate change. A rock that has helped to shape modern civilization. And is essential to life itself. What is it? It's an edible rock, salt. To show you why this holds a secret to our survival and success, I'm going on a journey. A journey through 190 million years of geological change. I'll see how salt saved the ancient Egyptians from starvation. How our Stone Age ancestors managed to find it in an icy Mediterranean wilderness. And I'll tell you a salty story of Venice that you won't hear from the tour guides. I'll show you how all this, our world, our civilization, even you and me, might not be here if it wasn't for salt. The Mediterranean is one of the world's most popular tourist destinations, but I'm not here on holiday. For me, as a geologist, the Med is an ideal place to understand how salt can have such a dramatic effect on our climate, our civilization, and our survival. Salt is fundamental to life. Without it, our nerves, lungs, muscles, and even hearts won't work. Ride the rail, please. We're constantly losing salt when we sweat. But our bodies can't make salt, so we have to eat it. We need salt to survive. Today it's all too easy to add it to what we eat. We don't need to do this. Our food naturally contains enough salt. So how does it get into our food in the first place? To show you, I'm going to leave the sunshine behind and travel back 20,000 years to a time when ice and snow covered much of Europe. I've come to Lapland in the far north of Norway. This is the nearest that I can get to how Europe would have been almost 20,000 years ago, when there were woolly mammoths in the south of France and reindeer in Paris. It gives me the chance to see how our ancestors found the salt they needed to survive in a frozen, inhospitable world. And to discover how this world would eventually be destroyed by salt. Twenty thousand years ago, our Mediterranean ancestors lived a nomadic life, hunting and gathering food. They thrived in a frozen world, with no farming and hardly any fruit or vegetables, thanks to reindeer. The original fast food. The only problem was catching it. I think I'll leave that to the experts. The 
it's still possible to sample the hunter-gatherer diet by visiting Lapland Sami people. Like the Sami, our Mediterranean Ice Age predecessors ate a diet made up almost entirely of reindeer. But where did they get their salt from? Fortunately for the Sami and our hunter-gatherer ancestors, in a world with few vegetables, reindeer came ready salted. Hello, excuse me, can I come in? Are you decent? <laughs> Today, the Sami offer tourists a taste of this ancient way of life. Okay, I'm Scotch for I've joined them for a traditional meal. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Sure. Wonderful, thank you. Thanks. What is this? It's reindeer meat. Reindeer meat? What? And, and also a reindeer tongue. This is tongue? This is reindeer tongue? Mm -hmm. Oh, OK. And the, what do I do? Do I eat it? <laughs> what do I do? Do I eat it whole? But maybe you must cut it up with a knife. This is not a good knife. You must use another knife. Oh, my gosh. This is a bit. I'm going to chop my finger off. <laughs> What's oh, the tastiest bit of the tongue then? Oh, it's like kidney. Delicious. I mean, delicious, honestly. And it's actually very good for some of the man's most important abilities. Oh, yeah? What? <laughs> Tell me more. Well, this is sort of Norwegian form for Viagra. A Viagra? Yes. This is Viagra, fantastic. Yes. Yeah, be careful. Well, no problem. <laughs> Saturday night, out yeah. in the, with your friends in Oslo. Is this be what you're eating? No. Reindeer kebab? No. <laughs> After the pubs are shot? Yeah. No? But what if there were no vegetables? No potatoes, no rice, yeah. no carrots? Mm -mm. Huh? It would be too much. I mean, that's what the hunter gatherers did. No bread, no vegetables. Apart from a few berries and some nuts, this was what they were eating. In fact, reindeer meat contains plenty of salt. But where, in an icy wilderness like this, did the reindeer get it from in the first place? We all know that salt is soluble. Much of the earth salt is dissolved in oceans. But there are tiny traces of it in water everywhere, in streams, in rivers, and in the ground beneath our feet. Water in the soil, with its tiny traces of salt, is picked up by plants. When glaciers covered much of Europe, plants could be pretty thin on the ground. But the reindeer knew where to look for them. They dug through deep snow to eat the frozen moss underneath. The moss contained salt, and by eating it, so did the reindeer. Which meant that reindeer meat provided all the salt and other nutrients the hunter-gatherers needed to survive. Turns out, unless you were a Stone Age vegetarian in search of a salad, the Ice Age wasn't that bad after all. The animals that thrived in the cold and icy climate provided humans with a perfectly healthy diet. But then, thanks to salt, all that was set to change. Salt! The very thing we needed to survive was about to destroy the diet that we'd come to rely on. Imagine this is the sun, and that snowball is the Earth. It turns out that the orbit of the Earth around the sun isn't the perfect circle that we might imagine. The Earth's orbit changes from an almost circular to an oval path, and then back again. The whole cycle takes about a hundred thousand years. 
Not only that, the angle that the Earth spins on its axis varies as well. If this is the North Pole, then over thousands of years, that angle changes, shifting the pole from pointing towards the sun when it warms up to facing away from it when it cools down. All this tilting poles and changing orbits means that the amount of heat from the sun that the Earth receives varies. As a result of which, 18,000 years ago, the whole planet got a little bit warmer. As the Earth's orbit changed, the world warmed up. But this alone wasn't enough to take the world out of the freezer. Here in the Arctic, there was something else. Something that would help to dramatically change the climate. And that something was salt. Salt plays a major part in driving ocean currents. It helps to move water between the Earth's oceans. These currents dramatically affect the world's weather. 18,000 years ago, combined with changes in the Earth's orbit, the currents helped to transform the climate and shape civilization. And it all started in the Arctic. Here, cold, dry air evaporates the seawater. But salt can't evaporate. It's left behind. This makes the remaining water saltier and denser, so it sinks down into the deep ocean. As the salty water sinks, water from the south has to move northwards to take its place. And when this water reaches the Arctic, the process begins again. Cold air evaporates the water. It gets saltier, sinks, and pulls yet more water up from the south. These currents are like a giant conveyor belt. But this salt conveyor moves more than water. It also moves heat. Imagine that walkway up there is the Atlantic Ocean. And where I'm standing here is the Pacific Ocean. Warm water from the equator moves south to north, like me through the Atlantic and eventually into the Arctic. As this warm water moves north from the equator, it raises the temperature of the sea and the air above it. It was this conveyor, in combination with a shift in the Earth's orbit, which dramatically changed the climate 18,000 years ago. As the planet got warmer, thanks to the salt conveyor, the increase in temperature spread up into the icy Arctic. The result? A massive meltdown. Ice that covered much of Europe slowly retreated. People in the south could only look on as their dinner moved north.
salt had changed everything. But it would also hold the key to survival in this warmer world. Egypt. One of the Mediterranean's most popular tourist destinations. With its baking sun and awe-inspiring ancient monuments. It's also the perfect place to discover how the hunter-gatherers who didn't head north with the reindeer survived when the world warmed up. For the last few thousand years, Egypt has been an inhospitable desert. Salt had helped create a warmer world for the ancient Egyptians, but they did more than just survive in the scorched climate. They went on to build one of the most successful civilizations in the ancient world. I'm going to sidestep the tour guides to show you how, although salt had caused the problem, it also provided the solution. As the world had got warmer, the glaciers that covered much of Europe began to melt. Water was released back into the atmosphere. It fell as rain and eventually found its way to Egypt. The Nile River is the lifeblood of Egypt. This water falls as rain over 3,000 kilometres away in the highlands of East Africa and Ethiopia. As the water flows off the mountains, it runs down to the Mediterranean Sea, going straight through the heart of this vast, dry country. Thanks in part to salt, the world was warmer and wetter. Egypt was blessed with the world's longest river, and on its banks was some of the most fertile land in the Mediterranean. A whole new way of life was about to emerge. In the new warm and wet climate, wild wheat and barley began to spring up around the Mediterranean. Slowly, the hunter-gatherers began not just to gather, but through accident, trial and error, to actually grow their own cereals. It was basically the first GM experiment. By carefully selecting seeds from the most suitable plants, the early farmers domesticated cereals and developed the wheats that were most suited to making bread. Bread provided people with a cheap, filling food. They began to cultivate other wild plants, like vines and olives. Farming had been born, and with it a whole new diet. But with the help of milk and the occasional piece of meat from the animals they domesticated, these farm foods would become the staples of the Mediterranean diet. By about 10,000 years ago, the seeds of modern Mediterranean civilization had been sown. There was a new diet, a new warmer climate, and a new way of life. For the ancient Egyptians, life was beginning to look good, and it seemed they had everything they needed to thrive. This incredibly successful civilization was also vulnerable. 
the warmer world had provided a new diet, but it also created a new danger, one that would kill thousands. Excuse me, can I ask you a question? Just sure. one question. Um, question is, what do you think is the most dangerous thing in the Mediterranean? I think the sharks. Sharks? Yeah, the sharks in the sea. I think sharks, but uh, also unexpected storms. Alcohol. Alcohol. What do you think is the most dangerous thing in the Mediterranean? Tornado. Tornadoes, OK. I think that's a shark. Shark, yes. Sharks again. I think the heat, the heat and dryness, and the fishes are in the sea. That's the rising of the, of the sea. Earthquakes. Earthquakes. Oh, that's a good one. I think uh, war. War. But there's something in the Med that's killed more people than war, disease, alcohol and sharks all put together. And that's water. <laughs> or rather, the lack of it. When salt helped to melt the ice, the climate that resulted could be perfect for growing crops. But the new farming civilizations relied heavily on this weather remaining favorable. And nowhere was it more precarious than in Egypt. To the ancient Egyptians, the annual flooding of the River Nile was crucial. But sometimes the rain didn't fall and the Nile didn't flood. The results were catastrophic. Crops turned to dust. Famine followed. And these droughts could last for years. Farming, on which the ancient Egyptians relied, lay in ruins. The people starved. They prayed to their gods for help. But prayers weren't what the ancient Egyptians needed. Their whole way of life relied on an unreliable climate. They had to find a way to protect themselves. And salt was about to provide a solution that would help the Egyptians combat famine. The story of how salt saved the living from starvation started in a most unlikely place. In the tombs of ancient Egypt. The ancient Egyptians believed that after death, a person travelled to a new life, the afterlife. And to get there, the body had to remain intact. The only problem is, if you put a body in here, it'll decay long before it makes it to the afterlife. The solution was on their doorstep. Outside, in the desert. The ancient Egyptians noticed that bodies that had been buried directly in the sand still had skin, nails, even hair long after they died. This body, now in the British Museum, was buried in the Egyptian desert over 5,000 years ago. It's so well preserved, even his ginger hair is still visible. It was a combination of very dry and salty sand that preserved the bodies. The sand absorbs the moisture and helps to kill the bacteria. The proteins in the flesh are forced to unwind, similar to the effect of cooking. This stops the rot that would normally happen after death. 
It was salt that held the secret to a successful afterlife. By burying a body in salty sand, it would remain intact for its new life after death. Back in the tombs and pyramids, the ancient Egyptians now knew how to preserve their dead. But they still had to make the process work, not in the dry desert, but in the dank, dark tombs and pyramids. With the lessons learned from those burials on the sand, the answer was simple. Rather than take the deceased to the desert, the ancient Egyptians found a way of taking the desert to the deceased. They scraped up salty sand from the desert and packed it around the body. After 40 days, the body had been mummified. It was ready for the afterlife. But more importantly, the Egyptians had unwittingly stumbled across a way to overcome famine. They were among the first people in history to realise the preservative properties of salt. And they didn't stop at bodies either. as well as jewels, gold, and even the occasional slave that the archaeologists found in these tombs. They were things like this. The Egyptians preserved food in the same way that they would a body. They would pack it in salt to draw out the moisture, and then they'd wash it and wrap it. Also, that mummy wouldn't go hungry in the afterlife. This knowledge of salt's properties was the weapon the Egyptians needed. They realised that if you can preserve food for the dead, you can do it for the living as well. The ancient Egyptians used salt to preserve fish and meat. But instead of burying them with the dead, these preserved foods could be stored until they were needed and then eaten by the living. From now on, if the rains failed, the Egyptians wouldn't starve. Wow. So salt, the stuff that had helped create that unreliable and warmer climate, turned out to be the very thing that helped the Egyptians and others survive in an unpredictable world. Salt had helped to change the climate and led to drought and famine. But by using it to preserve food, the Egyptians found a way to fight famine when the harvests failed. Food preserved with salt became an essential part of Mediterranean life. It soon became a rock that everyone wanted. And this demand made it a valuable commodity. Now another civilization would find a way to satisfy this demand and get rich in the process. To find out why, I'm going to have to go back millions of years, way beyond the Ice Age, to a time when the Mediterranean never existed. Imagine this soup is a great ocean called the Tethys. 200 million years ago, it stretched from the Straits of Gibraltar east to the Pacific Ocean, covering the area of the Mediterranean that we now visit. But all this was about to change. With some help from this bread, 
I'm going to show you what happened. This bread is a vast landmass. This bit here is Europe, and this bit is Africa. Thanks to processes deep in the earth, the plates move roughly at the rate your fingernails grow. It might not seem fast, but in geological terms, Africa is in the fast lane, speeding towards an unsuspecting Europe. The two plates collided in a massive rocky pileup. Under great pressure, the African plate squeezed against the European plate, with dramatic consequences. Mountains. Mountains like these are the beautiful product of that geological pile-up. Squeezed between the European, African and Arabian plates, Lebanon is home to some of the highest mountains around the Mediterranean. But rocky land is difficult to farm. The Phoenicians the people who lived in Lebanon 3,000 years ago couldn't make their fortune as farmers, but they would make it from salt. And their success story began in the mountains. Thanks to their higher altitude and rainfall, they had an abundance of trees. The resourceful Phoenicians put all this wood to good use. They used it to make boats and they soon became master boat builders and sailors. They were about to embark on a journey that would lead them to great wealth and power. The Phoenicians would become the first civilization to make a fortune from salt. Like all ancient sailors, the Phoenicians rarely ventured far from home. They navigated by sailing along the coastline from one familiar landmark to another. This was a slow process and limited them to sailing only short distances. But nearly 3,000 years ago, they realized there might be a way to sail further than ever before. It was after dark that they saw something really useful. The Phoenicians were among the first people to use the stars to navigate. They realized that by measuring the height of the North Star above the horizon, they could calculate their latitude, their position north or south. But the thing is, it's quite hard to do that when you can't see the horizon and when the boat's all over the place. But, but that is about 35 degrees, and that gives us our latitude, the distance from the North Pole. Thanks to the stars, the Phoenicians could sail across open water, far out of sight of land. And when they did, they spotted an opportunity. had been going on between neighbours for millennia. But the Phoenicians realised that they could expand this trade across the length and breadth of the Mediterranean. They built a string of ports and trading posts around the region. Using these, they traded goods from Lebanon in the east to Spain in the west, from the coasts of Africa to Europe. But for the Phoenicians, perhaps the most important place of all was the base they established right in the middle of the Med, 
on the island of Sicily. On their long journeys across the Mediterranean, the Phoenicians used Sicily as a stepping stone. They colonized the island and turned it into a vital link in their Mediterranean trade network. But they discovered that Sicily had something else to offer. Tuna. Lots of tuna. Every year, millions of tuna leave the cold Atlantic Ocean for the warmer waters of the Mediterranean. They swim straight past Sicily, making it one of the best places to catch them in the Med. This abundance of tuna presented the Phoenicians with a great business opportunity. By using salt to preserve the tuna, they could ship their catch across hundreds of miles of sea. If they could transport the tuna, they could sell it at trading posts from one end of the Mediterranean to the other. Like the Egyptians before them, if the Phoenicians wanted to preserve their catch, they needed to find salt. But unlike Egypt, there were no dry, salty deserts here in Sicily. If the Phoenicians wanted to preserve their catch, they'd have to find another way to get salt. They didn't have to look far. They were surrounded by the stuff in the sea. The problem was getting the salt out of the water. But the Phoenicians found the answer. They harnessed the natural process of evaporation to extract the salt from the seawater and began doing this on an industrial scale. By trapping seawater in marshes near the coast, just like these, and using the heat from the sun, they extracted salt from the sea. Salt's preservative powers had made it the most important commodity in the Mediterranean. And the Phoenicians now had an unlimited supply. This was geological alchemy. The Phoenicians had turned worthless seawater into white gold. But how did all this salt get into the sea in the first place? Why is the sea salty? Because uh, the salt is in the sea. <laughs> no, no, no. Yes. No, because the rain uh, is the same. No? The rain is the salt. It's the salt. The salty rain comes yes, down. Yes. I need to ask you one question. You don't speak any English? No, non capisco. Uh, because, because, because. Because the land has a little part of uh, uh, sodium chloride. Sodium chloride? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, only this. Because, che uh, domanda? Oddio, I don't know. This is harder than I thought. The legend of uh, a yeah. man yeah, yeah. with a magic, uh, magic uh, salt thing. Salt. Ah. Uh, Incanted. In so <laughs> so he, he, you know, no stop, no stop. All ah, right. So he salted the sea. <laughs> yes. The salt. Uh, well, that's probably salt. as good as any. <laughs> Grazie. Thank you. Sorry. The real reason is time, and lots of it, hundreds of millions of years. As rain falls onto land, it runs into streams and rivers 
or filters down through the earth. On its journey, the water collects tiny traces of minerals from the rocks and soil, including sodium and chloride, the ingredients of salt. Eventually, most of the water finds its way back to the sea. And that is where time comes in. With the help of these swimmers and their beach balls, I'm going to show you what happened. OK, come on. I know this is going to be crazy. Just come in. Is everyone here? You guys are droplets of water, agua, OK? And you've fallen as rain down onto the mountain here. Yeah? OK? Capicho? Yeah. Okay. OK? All right, so what I want you to do is the water picks up dissolved substances, salts. OK, so, so this beach ball and this beach ball are salts. This is sodium and this is chloride. So you can be sodium, chloride, and you all need to be salts, OK? So there's another sodium, chloride. OK, some salt. Some more sodium. Catch, catch. Hey, chloride. OK, now we're going to flow down to the ocean as a river. Come on, let's go. Everyone. OK, let's go. Get in the pool. Dive, dive, dive. At first, there wasn't much salt. So if you tasted the water billions of years ago, it wouldn't have been very salty at all. As the sun heated the sea, the water evaporated and rose up into the atmosphere. But salt can't evaporate. It got left behind in the sea. Meanwhile, the water in the atmosphere fell again as rain over land. It picked up even more salt and took it back to the sea. Where the whole process began again and again and again. And that is how over millions and millions of years the sea becomes salty. So by the time the Phoenicians set foot on Sicily, the Mediterranean was salty enough to taste. And this meant they could extract an almost unlimited amount of salt from the sea. The Phoenicians had harnessed the natural process of evaporation taking place all around them. With the salt they produced, they made a fortune. From their mountainous homeland in distant Lebanon, they had come a long way. They built boats learnt to navigate and created a Mediterranean trade network. A vital ingredient had been salt. In this new world of trade, salt had become a valuable currency in its own right, used to buy and sell goods across the Phoenicians' trade network. For now, by building salt pans around the Mediterranean, the Phoenicians controlled the region's economy. A tiny nation had become a Mediterranean superpower. A journey that began out of necessity led the geologically impoverished Phoenicians to become the first truly Mediterranean-wide civilization. Unfortunately, it wasn't to last, and it was the Phoenicians' very success that led to their downfall. That's the thing about success, it breeds envy. There's always someone else wanting to get in in the act. Men being men, that usually means one thing. War.
For the next thousand years, wars raged around the Mediterranean. The Phoenician Empire, which had once seemed so mighty, was soon forgotten. Waves of Greeks, Romans, barbarians and Arabs fought to control Mediterranean trade. And with it, salt. Out of this destruction came Venice. By the Middle Ages, the city had emerged as the greatest Mediterranean trade empire of all. And it was here that salt, which had dominated Mediterranean trade, would lose its value. Perched on a series of sandbanks and surrounded by sea, Venice was an ideal place to make salt. For hundreds of years, Venice's salt pans had made the city rich. The profits it made from salt are reflected in the city's opulent architecture. But all this was about to change. And in a strange irony, it was salt's effect on the climate that would end its role as a currency. Grazie, Roberto. Grazie. At the beginning of the 13th century, the Med in Northern Europe were ravaged by a series of floods and storms. The consequences for Venice's coastal salt production were terrible, with a third of the pans destroyed. Something had happened to change the climate once again, and the reason for all this change, we think, was salt. Remember these? They help to see how salt plays a vital role in controlling the Earth's climate. Salt in the Earth's oceans helps move around the heat like a giant conveyor belt. For thousands of years, salt had driven the system that brought warm water from the Pacific to the cold Atlantic. This had helped to keep Northern Europe warm. Then 800 years ago, we're not sure why, but the whole system stopped. Heat was no longer being circulated by the ocean conveyor belt. The earth cooled, just a little, but enough to make the climate colder and stormier. And it was those storms that damaged, among other things, production of Venice's salt. Storms ravaged the Venetian salt pans. It became harder and harder to produce salt. But salt remained a valuable commodity. The Venetians had to get it from somewhere. And if they couldn't make it, they'd have to take it from someone else. The mighty Venetian navy seized control of salt pans around the eastern Mediterranean. The city's control of this area gave Venetian traders almost exclusive access to the great ports of Constantinople and Alexandria. Here, they bought exotic goods carried over land and sea from India, China, and the Far East. And by selling these luxuries to the rest of Europe, Venice became the richest city in the world. At the height of the Middle Ages, 
wonderful palaces like these were built on the profits that Venice made from trade. But not only did buildings get more ornate, food got spiced up too. Spices, above all the luxuries the Venetians bought in the East, captured the imagination and taste buds of the West. Come over. These are all the spices. Sarah Cosija is an expert on medieval food. This is what's all about, you know. And these were definitely the greatest ingredients you could get in Venice in the old days when Venice was the leader of the spice trade. Yeah. There are lots of Incredible them. Incredible colours as well. These were among the most common spices, I mean, of the medieval dishes. Hmm? Right. You see here, for instance, even cloves and uh, the this nutmegs. Nutmeg? No, it That's is nutmeg. That's nutmeg, yeah. And then even saffron. This oh, is yeah. Saffron, yeah. Wow. Well, saffron was also used in order to dye, actually, dishes. Oh. Huh? So, in order to get the colour of gold. And you see the cinnamon. Cinnamon and gold. ginger. And I ginger think. also. So, where ginger. are they from? Well, they're from India and China, both of them. Oh, yeah, we got some, uh, well, pepper, for instance, which was the most expensive spice, huh? ah. and one of the very first to be imported to Europe. So pepper was yeah. the most expensive spice? Yes, the oh. most expensive one. Salt had at last found its perfect partner, pepper. From now on, in kitchens throughout Europe, the two would be inseparable. But it was spices like pepper that spelt the end for salt as such a valuable commodity. Oh, here you are. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Buongiorno. So, Ciao. Ready to, to cook now? Yeah, oh, I need an apple. Yeah. Is this for me? Yeah, that's okay. for you, yes, of course, yes. I'll put it so this way, you can tell I'm a man then. What is this? What is in the sauce? Food was no longer limited to what could be grown around the Mediterranean. Better now. I recognise water. They're stuck together. Dolcemente poco. Gently. Ancora un Just a little bit. E poi dopo abbiamo messo vinegar. Now people could enjoy food and exotic goods from across the known world. We're not going to eat all of that. We can try, though. Oh, we have a good bash. <laughs> <laughs> the saffron is oh, glowing in the light. The taste for spicy food quickly became an insatiable appetite. By the 15th century, this demand made spices like pepper far more valuable than salt. I didn't want to be rude, you know. <laughs> But reminders of Salt's powerful past were everywhere. I haven't seen any salt. Where is the salt on the Well, table? it's over there, you know, because, uh, well, the social rank uh, was gorged uh, by the position of the salt on the table. Ah. Mm -hmm. So I'm quite far away from that salt. Exactly. No, well, well, in this case, yes, the main chef. But, no, I think that's fine. <laughs> Today, I but maybe tomorrow, who knows? I you could be, I mean, just close to the salt. Mm -hmm. Right. So salt wasn't just a flavouring, it also no, established no. your social... No, in, social in, 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 the, in the... Well, here the, the word salary, for instance, comes from salt. Oh, huh? yeah. Because that's the way, I mean, that the Romans... Uh, used to pay, I mean, their slaves, huh? yeah, and yeah. the labour work. Worth the salt. With salt, oh. yes. So salario comes from sale, oh. so from salt. Salt's legacy is everywhere. In our food, on our tables, even in our language. Salt no longer has the power to build or destroy empires, but its power to upset the delicate balance of our climate remains as real as ever. Because the salt conveyor transfers heat, it plays a crucial role in moderating the temperature of the planet. But now we may be disrupting that sensitive system. 
we could be on the brink of the next big change. By burning huge quantities of fossil fuels, we are increasing the amount of carbon dioxide gas in our atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a so-called greenhouse gas. It traps the heat from the sun and creates a greenhouse effect. This causes the whole planet to warm up. And that's where things could go wrong again for the salt conveyor. Such global warming could have a dramatic effect on the Earth's poles. Because if ice caps melt, this would add a massive volume of fresh water to the oceans. All this fresh water in the sea would dilute the salt even further, and water wouldn't be dense enough to sink. Just like it did during the time of the Venetian Empire, the salt conveyor could slow down again. Or worse still, it could stop altogether taking us back to the climate of our ice-bound hunter-gatherers. With no warm currents from the equator, Europe and North America would become frozen wastelands. This unimaginable winter would last for hundreds, perhaps even thousands of years. Nearer the equator, with no cool currents from the north, things would get much hotter. Scary stuff. To some scientists, this is a disaster waiting to happen. To many, it's just a remote possibility. The truth is, nobody knows for sure if and when the conveyor could stop. But whatever happens, one thing is guaranteed. Salt will be crucial to the outcome. The story of salt is far from over. It's funny how we take it for granted. Coming up, history according to the Venerable Bede, why the Middlesbrough Transporter Bridge has links with Sydney, Australia, and the quest for the unsinkable lifeboat. From Newcastle to Hull, coast, next on BBC Two.